keynote address. Nelson D'Souza, chief guest of the program. Sir, you were confused with my surname. I am inspired by your name because we have an international conference on minority discourse and you bring to our mind the contributions made by Nelson Mandela when it comes to the Minority rights. And I must say that we are inspired by your presence. You kept saying that you are not an expert in this field. Neither am I. My PhD thesis has not been on this. Neither do I teach a paper. But still I accepted the invitation simply because of the temptation of being the keynote speaker of an international conference. And also because I thought when the subject is given to me, I would probably work on the subject and improve my own knowledge of a subject which is worthy of the attention of everyone. Now we have on the days secretary representing the management, Ms. Evelyn Benes, whose genial presence is always a powerhouse of motivation. We have our vice principal, Dennis Mary, whom I must say, as announced by Vandana, is the, who is the key force behind this whole uh, conference. And you have these two youngsters, Vinita and Vandana, my own student here, taking charge of this particular conference completely. Not an easy task at all. Among the audience, as announced by Vandana, we have Father Tito. Have I pronounced it rightly? And Mr. Akuna, once again, both the names uh, make me wonder whether I have distorted your names. I hope not. And I have my friend, confidant, guide, philosopher, all in one educationist and philanthropist, Phyllis Maria de Costa. Many of the faculty members of Roshanilaya are like my own colleagues because I come here very often and many of them are also my own students. If I start mentioning their names, five to ten minutes that Vinita has very generously given to me would be spent on mentioning their names, so I will not do that. I have my own students from Agnes who have come here to make paper presentations as well as attend the conference to get edified. We have students from Roshanilaya and other institutions. I must say that when I stand here as the alumna of Roshni Nilaya, the first point that comes to my mind is that many of the terms that we use when we have a discourse on minority rights, that is giving voice to the voiceless, bringing people from the periphery to center stage, spirit of democracy, an egalitarian setup, all these terms can very easily be applied to this premier institution, School of Social Work, Roshni Nilaya. Because, thank you. When I was a student here, it was not the extracurricular activities, it was not the curricular activities that brought about a change in our lives. But it was the very fact that no one was privileged however influential or powerful that student might have been because of the family background and things like that. No one was pushed to the periphery, to the fringes as useless. Everyone's voice was heard and we lived our blissful years of education in a complete atmosphere of freedom and democracy. I still remember the founder principal, Dr. Olinda Pereira, asking us 
not to compete in a fashion show, which was an intercollegiate competition, and we were not happy because we wanted to compete in the fashion show. She gave us the chance to listen to her dialogue. She brought, she took us to her chamber, discussed the matter with us, and also told us that it wouldn't add anything to our academic growth. However, if we still wanted, we could compete, and we did compete. And that was the kind of setup that we had. Why is it important to have that kind of uh, uh, atmosphere in an educational institution? It's important because when we go out into society, we go out into that society with a spirit of freedom and also the spirit of questioning what is not right and thereby we become social agents and an educational institution shapes individuals into social agents. Years later, I marveled at my alma mater because it took subjects which were considered taboo until then for its international conferences. Now the rights of uh, LGTB and the conferences that you have had, multiple conferences, were conducted when the subject was still not acceptable to a lay person. Now, of course, many other institutions and establishments have come forward to discuss it in the open, not in those days. And that is why when I conducted an international conference as the coordinator of IQAC and NAC in St. Agnes College, I joined hands with Roshini Nilaya and we had as our speaker Sunita, a victim of, or shall I say a survivor of extreme kind of uh, sexual exploitation but who started Prajwala to care for the children of such abused women. We also had Flavia Agnes who again is a survivor of domestic violence, but who has started Machlis and an organization that puts forth the rights of women and children and gives them the legal services. And through Innavi, which is a service organization, we join hand with Roshi Nilaya when it took up a radical idea of single mothers and it discussed adoption as uh, an important aspect to be borne in mind by people. And in all these things, I must say that the institution has been very progressive. That is why you have the right to take this particular topic of minority discourse more than probably many other institutions. Now when it comes to my <laughs> keynote address, I would like to take a two-pronged approach to the question of minority discourse. One as the literary theory and another as a praxis for social change. But before I come to the literary theories, let me also say that literature is rife with references to minority voices, beginning with Shakespeare. Now when we discuss Shakespeare, I discuss it with my first year MA students because we have the text, The Merchant of Venice. Do we discuss Shylock as an archetypical villain or is it possible for us to revisit the character of Shylock and reread the character of Shylock. Of course, I also read that there are many professors, university professors, who accuse Shakespeare of being a racist, a misogynist, and refuse to teach him in classrooms. But as far as uh, my interpretation of the text goes, the very fact that Shakespeare has given such passionate words to Shylock, where Shylock asks, do we not plead when you prick? When you tickle us, do we not laugh? When you poison us, do we not die? Just as a Christian would also bleed and die. 
we see that Shakespeare has made it possible for the readers to reread the character of Shylock. When it comes to Othello, ultimately, on the palimpsest of the ideas that we have of archetypical villains and heroes, it is not Othello who remains with us as a villain, it is Iago. So to that extent, I would say that Shakespeare has made it possible for us to reread these characters and has brought to center stage the question of race, ethnicity, etc. Coming to our own land, we had Mulkraj Anand discussing the plight of the untouchables in the epopinous novel, Untouchable, where he shows that Baka is ill-treated completely and his sympathies are completely with the subaltern. And we see that there are picturizations, characterizations of there is one particular Brahmin woman who throws bread at Baka in spite of the fact that Baka has shown a lot of humanity in bringing her wounded child back home. So Mulkiraj Anand does not have any grey area when it comes to how he has dealt with the question of uh, the untouchables. We also see that over the years there has been a change in the field of literature and in the field of critical theories. And when it comes to critical theories, we have our own Spivak, Guha, Partha Chatterjee. All of them, on the lines of the criticism of Gramsci, have come up with ideas of subversive methods, methodologies that we have to use if we have to question ideologies. And Spivak's Can the Subaltern Speak? is now, I think, uh, a sentence that resonates in the mind and in the intellect, intellectual spheres of all those who work on minority discourse or the plight of minorities. But then, the question that I would like to raise today is that, now before I go to that question, let me tell you that in the post-modernist era, it was in 1974 that we had the International Conference on the Nature and Context of Minority Discourse in the University of California. Now in 2022, we have the same title, Minority Discourse, after more than four decades and nearly five decades. That brings, us, brings the question to our mind whether the question of minority and the question of rights of the minorities has been like the proverbial blanket which was once asked, where are you now? And answered that, I'm exactly where I was thrown last time. So are we in the vicious circle where we do not really have answers? No, we are not. Because even if you take the sight of literature, I took Vaidehi for my PhD and in her novel as Prishil, she also shows the plight of the untouchables. But her approach to the untouchables is very different from that of Mulkiraj Anand because her untouchables are educated. Kumudini is educated and employed. Kusa, Kusa, Kusa can speak English fluently her untouchable women question as to why they cannot be touched. Her untouchable women dress up like the higher caste women and uh, in fact uh, flaunt their attraction which they say that higher caste women do not have. So there is a change in the perspective in the literary scene and there have been many developmental programs thanks to organizations and individuals. You have an organization, NAS, which takes up the question of sexual rights. Akai Padmash, Padmashali, right? Yes, she was here multiple times where she spoke about the rights of LGBT. So things have changed, things are changing. But my question to all of you, 
dear researchers and students is whether we have successfully bridged the gap between research and action oriented research. I feel that our theoretical approach, the question of putting an intellectual work would make much more sense only when we transform that intellectual debate into the action oriented research. Have we been able to do that is the question. And I feel it is the academia that can bring about this change because in almost all colleges we have uh, HR cells. Is it possible to have a cell that would work on the plight of minorities, be it uh, ethnicity, be it gender, be it language, we could have the minority question in various forms. Simple things. Is it possible to take a survey where you see whether crimes have gone unreported because many crimes take place and don't get reported simply because people do not have the courage to do that. So is it possible to have a door-to-door -door -door survey of that kind? Is it possible to educate our general public about even things like how to lodge an FIR? Many of them do not even know that there are public bodies, there are political measures that can be made use of when their rights as minorities are violated. To that end, I think it should be possible for the youth of India to be the agents of social change. And today my appeal to you is to, yes, intellectually debate the question of minority rights, but also be activists in taking up instances where minority rights are violated, even to the extent of questioning even WhatsApp messages which privilege the dominant culture and probably subjugate the minority culture. Having said this, let me also say that all of us must be aware of the fact that the very sight of minority culture, voice, everything is the shifting ground because what we would consider minority in one particular geographical area wouldn't be the minority in another geographical area. What, when we say minority rights within the minority itself, there would be power politics, there would be stratification, there would be a dominant culture within the minority culture. And also, as attempts continue to be put in to make to transform minority culture into dominant culture, as Pivak says, once they become the dominant culture, they cease to be the minority culture. A definition of minority culture itself is in shifting grounds. We should be aware of all these complexities when we make our paper presentations and probably try to bring about changes in society without the cynicism of thinking that no matter what we do, society will continue to be a site of hegemony, site of domination of the ones with power. With that message, I thank you once again for giving me this opportunity to be your keynote speaker and I must thank our media person because I think if at all I oh is again <laughs> clicking me. All right. Yes, thank you. Media person who will be actually in fact disseminating what has been discussed in this international conference in society and that is very important because every change is a slow change and media has a big role to play. All the best to all of you to be the social agents of change. Thank you very much.